So we're going to call you and find out how your arm yeah, that's is. true. <laughs> it sounds as if the way you were speaking, it sounds as if... Hey, Eric, where are you getting your shot? It sounds as if it was a little bit sore after the ammonia shot. Yeah, but that's yeah. it, just like the morning after. I'll just take, if I feel it bad, I'll just take a towel and all of that. You all will be fine. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Janice, have you got a date for your shot? Not yet, no. No. How about you, Tom? No, we haven't heard anything yet. No. Yeah, yeah, We're due to be vaccinated what? before the middle of February, but what? You can mute Scotland's it. going a wee bit slower no, than the rest of the UK. Tom, yeah. my friend uh, Sheila, who lives in Clyde Bank, she is going on Wednesday to the hub. All right. She gets hers then. Speaking of the sore arms, I, I just learned yesterday that if you move your arm around a lot, right after you get the shot, you'll, it won't get sore for you. I've, I've heard several people mention that and I've never heard of it before, but might be worth a try. Yeah, that's a good thought. <clears throat> Couldn't hurt. Well, since, since I have a full schedule today, I'm gonna to start at uh, right at 11 o'clock, so. Uh, okay, hey, bye. Okay. Okay, so uh, what we have today is we're going to go to two different places. One obviously is Thailand, and the other one is an island off of Baja called Cedros Island. Um, Cedros, anyway, you'll you'll start to see it all. Started here in Thailand. Uh, again, you can kind of get a sense of where it is in the world. Uh, China obviously is the monster above it. Uh, India is the large piece off to the left and uh, you've got all the other Indo Indochina or the, the Southeast Asian countries but Thailand is a, a good section right there in the middle of it. It's uh, obviously for me always has been a, a good favorite spot to fly into and then go from there to other places. One of the things that you see here is again the other countries that we visited Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Burma, um, it, it's such an, an amazing part of the world. So on this tour, uh, we <laughs> we end up uh, flying into the airport in Bangkok. And one of the things that you see right away is that uh, uh, everything is about smiling people and gratitude. And even their uh, <laughs> pinup girls are, are uh, very, very uh, oriented that way. And then you have even Ronald McDonald <laughs> that is going, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like, like to see this in America, <clears throat> a bit, little bit of gratitude. So in Bangkok, again, a little bit of an overview. You can see the streets, very, very wide streets and interesting traffic flow. You can see one, four lanes going in one direction and two lanes in the other. So it seems to move traffic very well around the country. Again, uh, at the beginning of most of my trips, I always like to, uh, uh, hang on, I've, I've got two people who are trying to get in. Um, this is my favorite place to go shopping, and I usually do it at the beginning at the end. It's uh, one of the largest shopping areas I've ever seen in the world. It's uh, I don't know, seven stories, uh, eight stories high, and it goes a quarter of a mile, and I'm not exaggerating, in all directions. So in the center of this shopping center is new stuff, and the farther you get out into the shopping center, it becomes used and uh, bootleg stuff. So it's just a it's just an amazing place to go shopping. Something that uh, we have never done here to be able to make a new and old blend together as far as shopping is concerned. That first evening, uh, there's three of us uh, in Bangkok right now, and we went out to dinner. And uh, going to dinner is uh, one of my favorite places, a place called the Banyan Tree Restaurant, and it's on top of this building. So you get this fantastic view uh, looking out at, uh, at, at Bangkok. Uh, but here you can see the tables. It's nicely set. As the evening goes on, 
um, the obviously the sun goes down, the lights come on, and it's just one of the more spectacular places to be able to spend the evening. Um, I was there as I Americans like to eat, or at least I like to eat early, but most of the Asian people always don't eat till eight or nine o'clock. So you can see, even though it's dark, people are not even at the tables yet. So one of the first things I always like to do, and I do this all the time, is to get leg massages. So here's one of my first leg massages, and uh, it, it costs about $6 for about 45 minutes worth of a pedicure and a leg massage. So it's always a good way to do after you've gone on a hike. So we're now going on a couple of little adventures around Bangkok, another one of these uh, amazing temples. Uh, at, this was, I found very interesting because he had a Chinese figurine outside of a Buddhist temple. Uh, this is a, a, a Chinese warlord. Why? I don't fully understand. Never could find out, but uh, it was not a Thai <clears throat> person guarding it. Just amazing temples that they have there. These are all Buddhist temples. Uh, the artistry and craftsmanship is just second to none. And uh, like I said, they're all over Asia, but B Bangkok has a lot of them. You inside one of the temples, obviously there is a, a the configuration of Buddha. The Thai. A configuration of Buddha generally is a thinner Buddha. You see that the majority of them, but then you also see what is typically also fat Buddha. And uh, so fat Buddha is, this is one where people give it a little bit of an offering, you rub his stomach and you can see where you want to give your, your uh, money to. You can put money into the front there, depending on which uh, fund you want to give to, whether it's sick monks, uh, sick, S-I-C-K, um, and anyway, just an int interesting thing. So I made my donations to uh, the X area, the area without an English translation, uh, because I figured that was, that's where the ties want to give to. So anyway, one of the interesting thing is there is a, what's called a reclining Buddha there. It's the largest Buddha um, that is uh, in, 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 in Thailand. It's 150 feet long and it's in a monastery called Wat Pho. W-A-T, you're going to see that name where I'll be mentioning at different times. And all it means is a temple. So Wat Pho, P-H-O is the name of this temple. <laughs> so it means Temple Pho. Mm -hmm. The reclining Buddha's head, I mean, it's just a massive. It was built originally in 18, this one was originally built in 1832. And uh, it was built by what is called Rama. There were different leaders. His, his leader's name was Rama III. These temples are, like I said, you can climb on most of them. Uh, you can see the tourists a little bit on the left-hand side climbing the very steep stairs, but it, uh, it gives you an idea of what uh, the size of these places. In each one of these uh, temples uh, or, or is is so ornately laid out because these uh, ceramic tiles you can imagine each one had to be fired individually uh, and then placed on the temple in the right place one of the things you see a lot around asia in, in the thailand i mean in the temples is sayings and i loved some of these sayings and this was one of my favorite <laughs> laugh as much as you breathe and love as much as you live <laughs> it's a very good mm -hmm. saying so we're going to just move up the river a little bit. We hired this guy uh, to take us up uh, the river and uh, to show us a couple of things. And uh, you can imagine what he's got on the back there is a V8 engine, uh, a very powerful uh, American car engine. Um, and then he's got a, a, a propeller. You can see it splashing out the back. So he manhandles this thing to be able to get this long boat around. So Gary and I and Dave, the three of us are on this trip. Um, 
we asked him to take us to where tourists necessarily don't go. I want to see the back areas of Bangkok because I, I can see all the touristy stuff, but show me where people actually live. And so he took us down a couple of these canals. And so this is the real Bangkok on the water. Um, you can see how people live. They, you know, they eke out their little existence and they're right there on the water. There's your typical backwater uh, ties who are on their little boats. They're either selling something or they're moving some of their goods to somebody, but it's the easiest transportation if you're near the water on how to get around. Another little lady coming out of one of the side canals and you can see her little engine out the back. She's not using it. She's just kind of sitting there. I don't know what she was doing, but uh, her hat looks like a, <laughs> like a lamp hat, <laughs> but she was, she was very cute. Very typical backwater area. Somebody had had a boat, obviously just parked it on the side and that becomes their home. So here we left with our taxi man and uh, we're now going back to what is considered normal Bangkok away from where the people live. And so this is now you start to see some of the buildings that are downtown Bangkok near the river, which are just, you know, spectacularly beautiful, large buildings. So here's my two friends, uh, Gary and Dave, and they're both people who work in the computer industry. Uh, the man on the left, as Eric knows, is a Nortel person or used to be Nortel. Anyway, he is making a comment about like, how does the internet work here? Because <laughs> you know? yeah, it's just, just fucking freaking crazy, the, the wiring that they have there. And so here you see a guy who's doing some repairs in the wiring. So he's taking his bamboo pole a bamboo ladder and leaned it up against the wiring and he's up there in his uh, blue jeans and t-shirt fixing whatever he's fixing. <laughs> so here's my friend Gary again. You can see that they made this wiring adjust around the transformer. So when they needed to make a service loop, here's the service loop going around the transformer. Anyway, it was just a, a funny thing. This is your typical Thai or Asian uh, street food. And I know some of the ladies, Leslie and, are, and Ellsworth are gonna look at this and go, I couldn't eat here, but I'll tell you, you can at least see the food where it comes from. In most of the restaurants, no matter how good the restaurants are, you have no idea what the restaurant kitchen looks like. You know, here, this guy has to bring out his chicken, has to bring out the water, has to boil everything. It's all there. It, anyway, it's easier to eat. For me, it's easier to eat off the street, but this is your typical vendor off the street. If you need anything fixed on the street, cost you almost nothing. There are sewing machines everywhere. People, you know, little lady's got her sewing machine. She'll fix whatever it is you need fixing, but this is your, your normal thing. One of the things that they're very respectful of is their king, because whenever you go anywhere, there's always a picture of the king as there is here, where they attach the poster of the king to a, a, a coat hanger behind them. But uh, it, they, they, there's very much revered. So we're now leaving uh, Thailand, excuse me, leaving Bangkok. And this is the Bangkok airport. And uh, we're going to fly from Bangkok south to an island called Phuket. And I know you've heard of this. Phuket is in southern part of Thailand. And uh, what people don't fully understand is that Phuket has now turned into the last five or six years into an inter, almost an international airport because when it's cold in Moscow and cold in Geneva and cold in Helsinki, anybody who's got any money wants to go to where it's warm. So they all fly directly from all of those capital countries in the cold part of Europe and directly into Phuket. They never even fly into Bangkok. So here is the island of Phuket, what it looks like. It's a relatively small island with a, um, an airport at the top. And you can see on one side, all of these names. Well, all of these names, you're gonna see the pictures of these beaches. These are some of the most beautiful beaches you've ever seen in the world. And this is why people go to Phuket is because of the beaches and the, the, the lifestyle. Um, 
This right now is the Phuket airport. It's relatively small, overly congested. They obviously have to rebuild the whole thing because of all of these airplanes coming in. But it's it's like uh, Calvin San Lucas was 20 years ago when I first went there. It was a small airport. And now it's just, uh, you know, 20 planes a day with 500 to 700 tourists a day on each airplane coming into Calvin San Lucas. Well, that's what Phuket is turning into now. We ended up in Phuket, and this was our hotel. Uh, we booked it from Bangkok, and it was $75 a night. Uh, just a real nice place. So Gary and Dave and I, obviously, we want to go see what's going on on the island. So here we rent these mopeds from our hotel, and $7 a day will rent you a moped all day long. So we go to the southern part of, uh, up of Phuket, and uh, there's a very long dock there that we walk out with a restaurant at the end of it. And you can see all the sailing boats in the bay. This bay is for any sailors, I don't know if Sue's on right now, but for any sailors, when they go to Thailand, they end up in this bay. It's a very nice place to hang out, uh, calm, comfortable, access to all the supplies you need, but it's very famous for people dropping anchor and staying here to get supplies. Here's Dave and I uh, at the end of that uh, mar marina dock, and we're looking, and you can see in the background there uh, mm -hmm. that white, what looks like a Buddha on top of the hill. Well, it is a Buddha on top of the hill, and they're just building it, um, and they're very proud of it uh, because it's going to overlook all of Phuket, and you'll be able to see it all across the island. Again, I, I do this once in a while. It's just interesting to, I know the ladies wouldn't do this, but this is your typical toilet, um, you know, with a little wash basin on the left and a place to put your feet. And uh, anyway, this is a tourist toilet. <laughs> so here we are in, uh, again, at that uh, large area um, where the Buddha was. And this was, there are many different types of uh, what they call Nagas, which are spirits that uh, protect Buddha. And this was one of my favorite Nagas. And these are, are, are uh, spirits. They're um, snakes that are put together. And this was originally, the idea here was that it was to protect Buddha from the rain and from everything else. So this would go over the top of Buddha. But Anyway, just it's called Saturday Buddha is the, the English name for it. And in Thailand, like I said, at this facility, it, it has many sayings. And if you read some of these, they're just, it, it's again, very profound stuff and very interesting stuff. When time passes and the man is older, things which must be increased is maturity. <laughs> anyway, if you read down those, it's just, uh, it, they're, they're good, they're very interesting sayings. So as we're now heading towards the beach, we're up at the top where they're building this Buddha and we're looking down at what is called Kata Beach. And Kata Beach is famous for in 2004, they had a tsunami in, uh, in Malaysia. And uh, one of the tsunami, one of the waves came into this beach area that you can see in the background there. And what it did was kill 250 people. I took this picture, I took this picture off the internet just to give you an idea because the water came in, you can see it literally overran all the hotels, all the buildings, or the beaches, because the tsunami was so large and that's what ended up killing uh, 250 people, tourists. So here is the beach now. And so I'm standing at one end of the beach, obviously taking a picture down. So you can see, imagine a wave coming in um, to this beach. There is very little holding it, uh, holding it back other than the fact that it's going to wipe everything out in between is what it did so most of these beaches are overrun uh, like this beach here is called patong beach and uh, it's another beautiful beach area uh, 
is overrun by mostly Russians in the couple of years that I've been there uh, because the Russians have a little bit of extra money. And when it's cold in Russia, it is very cold. And when it's warm in Asia, it's very pleasant, as you can see. So any Russian who's got any money ends up going to these beaches along here. And it's just a, just a great place. This is again, Patong Beach. And uh, you can see it's just a typical Thai beach. It's just second to none in the world. So here we are, we're going around the island, continuing and you know, a signpost you don't see too often, you know, elephant crossing, but uh, <laughs> there was a gentleman on an elephant and uh, he asked me if I wanted a ride. And I said, absolutely. So he puts me on the back of the elephant and so here is Barry, the guy, I get on there and he puts me right behind the ears and the guy jumps off and he says, okay, and the elephant's gonna follow me. And I'm going, well, how do, how do you drive an elephant, right? And so here, here, here I am, and he's taking pictures of me. It's just, you know, I am sitting on the top of this elephant and he's going down the hill. And, and you know, obviously it's a, it's a slow moving thing, but it was just interesting. It, it gave me a very odd feeling, um, but I, I can understand how you move them because it's what I found out later, it's with your legs. He feels your ears, you're, you're pushing on his ears and that moves him a little right and a little left. But you know, I'll probably not ride another elephant in the rest of my life, but it was, it was, it was interesting. So, you know, can he get his leg around that tree? Can he keep coming down? So here, Gary and Dave are in the background laughing at me because here I am, I have to get off and they've, they've got this platform because the tourists, you got to get them off safely. So, you know, you don't want them jumping off of the elephant. So they got to have a platform where you get off on. So we continued around the island and it turned out that Dave, my friend Dave, had a friend who lived on the island and he has a boat. And so being boaters, you know, he says, would you like to go out to the islands for a few days? And I'm going, okay, <laughs> let's go. So his boat is called Really Naughty Two. So the guy's a very avid deep sea fisherman. And in that part of the world is uh, very good deep sea fishing. So this marina, just to show you, is not your normal American <laughs> marina because there's lots of old junky boats sitting everywhere. But uh, you know, there's a couple of Americans with some nice boats. So here I am on the boat. We're going out to sea. We ended up spending a couple of days on the boat, and uh, um, and the number one thing that you have to have aboard if you're going to go out for a couple of days is enough beer. So you know. Uh, beer and we had some food and uh, you know fishing and being on the water. I don't know how much better it gets than that, but that's 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 part of it. So we're heading out to these islands, and these islands are mostly uninhabited, but they were just a, a good place to fish around to be at. This was one of the little areas that uh, we ended up uh, anchoring right offshore and that ended up swimming in there and it was just a, a beautiful sandy beach, uh, I don't know, about 15 miles off the coast of Phuket. But what you also find out there are Thai fishermen. So this is your Thai fishermen who during the day are processing the, the, the fish because this one is tied onto a mooring ball uh, but most of the time they fish at night. Okay, we're now going to leave Phuket, which you can see in the bottom left, the island, and we're now going to another island uh, called Koh Samui. And you can see right there where it says A, that is Koh Samui. Koh Samui is one, I mean, I thought Phuket had beautiful beaches. Koh Samui is just off the Richter scale for beautiful beaches. Um, you don't have exposure to uh, big waves because you're inside of the Gulf of Thailand and you're facing uh, away from any wave action. So it's this very small lapping uh, water that comes into the, these beautiful sandy beaches. And uh, if anybody ever wants to go to a sandy beach and hang out, the, this is where you need to go is Koh Samui. 
Uh, it's just just spectacular, and it's full of Europeans who have been going there for years. Uh, almost no Americans there. So you can see, you know, beautiful water, uh, people walking. Uh, the places, if you can't find a place to, to spend the night, which we, when we arrived in Costa Mo, we had no reservations. We just started walking down the beach, found a place. And I think it was $35 a night, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's stuff that is just dirt cheap. If you want to spend in high-end places, you're not going to get any nicer than this. You know, the bedroom may be nicer, but the accommodation, the outside is no nicer. So here was our hotel we stayed in. They had a little pool, but you know, most of the time, what do I want to use a pool? I got the beautiful ocean there. So here's Dave in the morning time standing. They've built this little uh, uh, raised area. So if they were to get any kind of wave action, they wouldn't get into the restaurant, but you have your morning breakfast there, right there uh, overlooking the water. So there's your morning breakfast. So I took this picture just to show some people that, you know, this is a, a place on the beach. If you want to rent one of these places, a little bungalow, you can see it's four to 400 to 1,000 baht a month. What that translates into is $13 to $30 per room per night. So in other words, one of these bungalows on the high end is $30. So uh, you can see why the Europeans, when they freeze their butts off in Europe, uh, will spend a month on these beaches and they're really spending nothing. So here he is obviously on the beach again. Uh, I'm having a beer with a couple of people in the background. One of the other things that is always a good thing to do, you're hanging out at the beach, we were there about a week, is uh, get a massage, right? For another $7 an hour, you can lay here and watch the lazy afternoon go by, have a beer and get a massage. And you go, <laughs> you know, you think you're in heaven most of the time. So we now are leaving the area and we're going out to the islands away from Kosumui. There's a couple of small islands out there. And uh, it, I thought it, it was beautiful in Kosumui. Well, it gets more beautiful out of the islands. Here you can see the water turning uh, this beautiful color. The beaches are just, I mean, they're beyond anything that, that anybody could imagine. But you can see how many people are there. There's very few. This is the guy that took us out there. Again, one of those typical long boats. It's got an engine, and uh, this is basically the transportation there. And if you notice the, just like the guy with his big V8 that he had on the back of that long boat, they all pivot on one point in the back. So they're not fixed. They're sitting on this pivot point. That's how they move them right and left and up and down. Uh, but it's an ingenious way of using um, um, a propulsion system. So this, we're now on one of the islands. We're looking out and you can see it's just, you know, it's just spectacular. In the middle of this island is a lake. Um, it's obviously not a lake you can swim in because you can see the side walls are very vertical, uh, but it's just, just a magnificently beautiful place. But this is all fresh water uh, because over the thousands of years or millions of years, this was just a, you know, slowly got filled. And I, since I love cacti, um, this was just a, a, a the Kalam. Anyway, it's a, a cactus in Thailand. Um, you can see how many thousands of years and millions of years the water's been lapping on the underside of this rock by slowly wearing it away. But uh, um, it, it's as we go around these small islands. It's just a beautiful area. Another spectacularly beautiful beach. Nobody on it, very few people on it. So we're now going to leave Koh Samui and we're going to fly north. And it's about a $100 flight one way up to Chiang Mai. 
in Chiang Mai is you could see uh, getting close up there to the Chinese uh, Laotian border. It's a little different area. And why I wanted to go up there at the time was it's a cooler area. So it's a little more mountainous. And uh, so in Chiang Mai, you're higher up and you get way more Americans living up there all year round because it is cooler. Because Thailand generally is, as tell my wife, there are three temperatures, hot, very hot, and freaking hot. <laughs> and so, you know, choose your, choose your temperatures. But if you want to be where it's cooler, you got to go high. And so Chiang Mai, where we're going to go to now, is a little bit cooler. Again, as we are landing in Chiang Mai, one of the first things I saw is another one, these lovely sayings, and Thai Buddhist sayings, the modest is beloved, which is absolutely correct, which is what Trump didn't understand. <laughs> uh, so here we are in uh, Chiang Mai. And so again, it's a, a beautiful town. In the center of it uh, are again, all the temples, like in Mexico, the center is always the, um, the, the churches and the, the center the center area, but it's the same in Thailand. It's, it's, it's where life happens. Um, this temple here is called the Wat, W-A-T again. So it means uh, Shaddai. And it is a temple that was started in 1385. And uh, over the years, people have looted it and taken things away from it. Uh, but right now, they hire the, the Thais to go in and take the weeds out by hand because they don't want to spray any uh, defoliant or Roundup or anything on the bricks because everything is so precious. But you can imagine <laughs> all day long pulling weeds on the side of these temples. <laughs> So this temple, this was one of the few what are called nagas again. Uh, these are spirits uh, on the front of the temple. Um, you can see that this was an entrance to the temple uh, and the great reverence on all of the temples all through Asia uh, to the elephants. Another one of these wonderful signs. <laughs> this is obviously written by somebody who tr literally translated words, <laughs> but never had an English person translate it. But it's beware the fraud, guide pay playoff, he means ripoff, in the temple. Try to scam the tourists to buy the things and tour service very cheap and beware the sprinter property of you. You know, if you can translate that and you all they're saying is watch out for your shit because somebody's going to steal it. But it was just a, I, it was humorous for me. So again, one of these great sayings around town Gaining age is losing life. <laughs> so we're now going to go outside of uh, Chiang Mai a little bit. And there is a, 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 a hill tribe. And they're called the Karen people. K-A-R-E-N. Karen people. And you're going to recognize some of these people. And they live in these houses. So we come up to them. And what it is, is this is a village of people. And the Karen people have lived in Laos, have lived in China, have lived all over. But everybody pushes them out of their country because they don't want them. Not that they're Muslims. I, I don't fully understand all the, their tr rivalry. But this gentleman here, what he's doing is using this hand uh, rocking device where he steps on, steps off of it, and it's slamming into the rice to separate the husk from the rice. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very old way of doing. But the Karen people, what they're famous for is the rings that they put around their necks. So you've probably seen this. This is a young girl here who sits here and you can see her back support and she's weaving things to sell. But her parents have already put a half a dozen rings around her neck. Um, and very, a pretty girl, you know, but no ability in her life, obviously, to do anything other than what she's going to do is uh, because I don't know where the value is to putting rings around your neck and stretching that out. Uh, but it, it's just, it, it's something that you, you see. I, I don't, I, there's the mother, right? Oh, God. And so 
what you end up having, and I didn't know this, they actually don't stretch the neck. What they actually do is collapse the, the shoulders. The shoulders collapse because the neck doesn't stretch. There's only so many vertebrae that can be stretched out. But it, it's just amazing what, what over the years that they do to their systems. Um, a, a, a relatively young girl, you can see, she doesn't have as much uh, and as many rings as the mother yet, but uh, you know they're very proud of the fact that they have these rings around their neck and they're, uh, this is their way of life. And the only thing that they're selling is the stuff in the background. So obviously I had to buy some stuff. Mm. You know, very interesting, but they, they eke out this little existence there's that same lady again in her shop standing there. You know, you can see, it just, you can imagine if you had to take those rings off. I mean, her whole head, I, I don't know what it would do. It's probably just collapse. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, uh, these are the young kids that have the beginning of their, of their lives going and the parents are telling them to put the rings around the neck. So it was just interesting for me. And behind, this is how they actually live. I wanted to see how do they live, right? And so behind where they were showing us these things, this is their house, this is their cooking. So it's so third world, but they, you know, how, how much money can you make selling this stuff? And uh, nobody wants them in their country and uh, they're always on the move. So it, it, it's a very tough thing. Now, here was an interesting thing that... Uh, uh, at least for me, was that there was a Thai person that was very inventive. What do you do with elephant poo? Okay, so well, they have figured out what to do with elephant poo. So here's the raw elephant poo, and what you do is you boil it. And once you boil it, you take all the bad things out of it. Yeah. Then, then they okay, ended well, up putting it into well, these vats where they add coloring to it. Okay. And then you, what you end up doing is you take the, the elephant poo that is colored and you put it on these screens. And what you're going to end up with is a screen that you put in the sunshine and then the screen eventually becomes paper. So you can actually, and I looked on Amazon, you can buy what's called elephant poo paper. <laughs> so, you know, it's an ingenious way of somebody in Asia, in, in that area of Chiang Mai, to be able to make a product out of something that everybody would look at and would get, this is junk. So anyway, a real quick one. So um, we left uh, Thailand, we just flew up to uh, Korea. South Korea, and I didn't know when I flew there that they were going to, that I didn't look at my schedule that closely, and I had a day to kill when I got to Korea. So what do you do at a day in, in, in Korea? Well, the Koreans have figured this out. They have free buses. So at the airport, you jump on these free buses, and you can spend all day touring Seoul. And these are just a few pictures right now of Seoul. Um, it was... A, this is not my picture, but this is a picture of the center of Seoul. There is a, a palace called the Guangdong Thung, whatever, I can't pronounce it, palace, and it was built in 1395. So we, we walked and toured it. This is still the original palace that has been obviously cleaned up quite a bit. Uh, this is in Seoul, Korea, the inside of the palace. Just, just interesting shots of something different because uh, I don't know whether I'd want to go see South Korea. It's not really interesting. It's a, it's so first world. There's not much. Uh, uh, there's the beginning of Seoul. You can start to see the normal buildings of how people live. It's no different than L.A. Uh, one of the streets uh, that we are shopping, uh, what a street looks like in Seoul. Anyway, just, just a couple of shots out of Seoul. Then they took us to a couple of more religious uh, temples. And these are just religious points in Seoul. And then we ended up going back to the airport. So now we're gonna change horses real quick, go to a different part of the world. 
this world now is called Mexico. <laughs> um, so what this is, there's an island that is about 300 miles south of San Diego, Tijuana. And it's an island called Cedros Island. And if you've flown to Cabo San Lucas, and if you're looking out the window, many times you'll see Cedros Island, but nobody ever stops there. Well, I've been up and down this coast about six times on a boat, on my sailboat. And uh, we always stop at Cedros and there's an endless places to stop. But Cedros is such an interesting place that a friend of mine was going back there to visit a person that we had met and uh, we you know, start to see in a second what, what happened. We left uh, San Diego. This is Cedros Island. The vast majority of Cedros Island you cannot drive on. There's only the very southern part that is open to driving because the whole island is about um, 24 miles long and 11 miles wide. It has about 4,000 people that live there, but they all live in the southern part. In the northern part, there's a very small community, I think, of 30 or 40 people. So let's start out. Here we are in Ensenada. This is my friend's boat, um, and this is in the Ensenada Harbor. It's uh, for those boaters at Taswell 49. Um, that's the inside of his boat. Uh, so as you can see, it's a you know, it's like taking a limousine to Mexico is a, is 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 an, is a good good way to look at it. But this is the inside. So first thing when you leave Ensenada that you have to do is to go to uh, check out uh, because every time you kind of do a port in Mexico, a major port, Cabo San Lucas, Mazatlan, whatever it happens to be, you've got to check in with a port captain. Um, so we checked in, checked out with a port captain in Ensenada, and now we're starting to head south. And one of the first places that we headed for was a place called San Catin, which doesn't mean anything to you other than it's just a very nice anchor spot. So we pulled in here to spend the night, um, and it was just a place to rest. So Jamie and I, as we're dry, as we're taking the boat south, we always drag what's called a drag line behind. And uh, you can see the blue line near the tail of the fish that would go behind the boat. And you're, you're basically dragging a line behind waiting for a fish to come on. This was a skipjack tuna that we caught, but you can catch this stuff all day long. It's just, it was good sashimi for dinner, <laughs> fresh sashimi. So, as we put, go further south, we stop at a little island called San Martin. And uh, again, San Martin doesn't have anything to offer and it's got a couple little uh, buildings on it. And these are what are called fishing villages, places that the Mexican fishermen go to and fish from. And their families live there with them and their kids sometimes live there with them. And obviously there's no ability for them to get very much supplies. So when they see a boat that comes in and anchors, they come over to you in their boats. And this is called a ponga. And so what they're fishing for here are lobsters. So they have all these lobsters and they're going, they're looking for things like batteries, pencils, paper, anything for their kids, you know, things that they can trade. And so what they're trading with you is, is fish for some of your supplies. Um, so here we ended up getting three nice lobsters and I can't remember what we gave them. I think it was some batteries and stuff and they were just very happy. They didn't want money because they can't spend it, right? I mean, what do you spend it on there? So they want supplies. So this was the end of the evening. These were our three lobsters we had to consume. <laughs> you know, it was a, a tough duty. So now we leave that little area of San Catin and we're now on coming into Cedros. Cedros Island is, like I said, a very uh, small island. And this is the harbor. And I took this picture off the internet just to give you an idea. There's the village you can see. And there's a few other people living around in other places nearby. But that's basically the village. And the harbor is very, very small. So this is us coming into the harbor now. 
um, and you can see it's a it's very barren. Um, they they don't have much, but what the Mexican people have there that live on Cedros Island is pride, no crime, no drugs, and uh, no gangs, right? And so it's a very safe place for people to raise their kids and do things. So we stopped, got off obviously, went up to shore. This is the our introduction, the sign where it says, welcome to Cedros Island. So there you can see the harbor and you can see our boat uh, in the harbor where we dropped anchor. So you can see that there's, uh, you know, tourists non-existent. There's no tourist boat that stops here. There's hardly any sailors that stop here. But uh, I f you'll see why I find it interesting. So first thing you have to do again, check in with a port captain. So you go to the port captain. So now we're walking around town and you can see it's your typical Mexican town, no paved streets, you know, dirt, uh, but, but, you know, people are not unhappy. One of the industries on this island is salt. So mainland of China, uh, mainland of Mexico uh, in what's called Scammon's Lagoon, which is on the mainland, is where the largest salt production facility is, where they have these huge lagoons where they allow salt water to come in. They let it dry, then they scrape the salt off. They put the salt into these uh, containers and they send the salt over to Cedros Island because in, as they, this picture, I, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. This picture is the mainland of Mexico. These are the lagoons uh, on the mainland that are used by um, the people that, that uh, mine salt, uh, sea salt. And this lagoon also is called Scammon's Lagoon for the Americans that are here and have been there. And Scammon's Lagoon is also the place where the gray whales go every year. It's a huge lagoon that is relatively shallow and it gets very shallow the farther back it gets and that's where the salt flats are. Uh, but this is world famous if you want to go to Mexico to see uh, gray whales migrating and things. Uh, this is where they're migrating to to have their, have their calves. So the salt on Cedros Island is in huge mountains. And it turns out that it was started by an American many years ago, but the Japanese bought it in the 1950s, I think it was. And now Mitsubishi owns this. So all of this salt gets put on ships and then it gets transported to Japan. So you know, for the Mexican mainland, barged over to Cedros Island, put there, and then put into a large ship to send overseas because the, the port in this area is all owned by Mitsubishi. So it's just, for me, it was just very interesting. The other interesting thing on the island was they, they, they have the very first abalone nursery in the world. So because there are so many abalone and lobster and sea fish that are there, um, this is the first abalone nursery. So they gave us a tour of the place um, and they start them off, uh, the little baby abalones on uh, seaweed, and then they slowly progress through until here is a full grown abalone. So this is the backside of the abalone. This is what no, most of the time what we eat when you go in to pay a fortune for a piece of abalone. This is what you'll eat. The other side is the shell, what we're holding, what my friend Jamie's holding. But uh, it's a delicacy, basically. And so the Mexicans, also they take this abalone and they uh, can it because they sell it to, to all over Mexico and all over South America, almost not heard of up in America. Um, and the name, the brand name is Sedmex, uh, but it's the Mexican version of, uh, of how a canned abalone would be. The backside of this place was just mountains of uh, shells because absolutely, if you, if you get the meat, you got to have shells left over. So they wanted to know, did we want any of these shells? Do you want to take some of these with you? And I said, well, I'll take one, but I, you know, so it was just a 
fascinating. So we continue to drive uh, on Cedros, and uh, as we're driving, we see this coastline. It's a beautiful coastline. Walk down, and uh, here we have some sea life. I mean, it's just magnificent because there's almost no human touching this. It's open ocean all around, and this is just Mother Nature at its absolutely finest. On this one side of Cedros is another little fishing village. And this is what are called second homes for most of the fishermen. So when they live on in Cedros, they live in town, but they also have these little communities around the island when they are fishing that they can come back to. So if they're there for two or three months, the families live there, there's a church there, and it's a place that they use for fishing every day. So my friend, um, Jamie and Elaine, the gentleman in the red hat, that's Jamie and Elaine, um, we're just enamored with it. But Jose, the gentleman in the green there, who is the gentleman we met uh, on the island, uh, knew some people in this village. So he's gonna introduce us to some of the fishermen who are in during the day. And one of the fishermen, this guy here, Victor, and his wife, Carolina, are just the most amazing people. They're husband or wife uh, with two kids, just the happiest, nicest Mexican family that you'll ever meet uh, But in Mexico. But again, why do they live there? Because they can raise their kids there in safety. They got a, he's got a job. He, he, you know, and what do they have to share with us? Lobster. So, you know, he goes into the back and he fries up some lobster for us uh, to say thank you for coming by and seeing their house and seeing their place. And it's very modest. I mean, here is their place. So what person in America wouldn't want to live right there on a cliff overlooking the ocean, right? So, you know, these people, they, they, it's just, I love to see how people live beyond our lifestyle. And this is such, it was so gratifying to see. So Jose, the gentleman that you saw early on, he takes us uh, back to the little town of uh, Cedros, uh, on Cedros Island. And he shows, he's walking around here, showing Jamie and I where he's gonna build a building here. And at first I thought, the guy's crazy. What do you mean build a building on the side of the hill? Well, a couple of years passed and that's what he built. <laughs> Right, and so this is a, a fishing lodge. It's called Baja Magic is what he ended up call, calling it. And it is one of the world-class fishing places. If you want to fish Mexico and fish authentically, um, this is because you're in the middle of the open ocean. So you've got all the giant fish in the world that you're going to be able to catch here. But so Jose had an, an amazing idea. Again, going back, that's where it started and that's where it ended. You know, so I give the guy a huge amount of credit. So anyway, continuing on, we went up the island. And as we're going up the island, as you saw before, there's not much on the island. But all of a sudden, I see a, tr a green tree. Well, so I said, what's going on with the green tree? Well, it turns out that there are a bunch of springs on the island, and this is one of the springs, so where they get fresh water. And obviously, so this uh, it was just a place we went by. As we're heading north on the island again, uh, I see what looks like another piece of paradise over there. Well, how are you growing these trees again? Well, again, this is another very good spring over there and fresh water coming out of the ground. And so why does this grow? Because there's fresh water there. So we continue heading north and uh, just sea life galore because wherever you go, the sea life is all around you. So they're, they're all just curious and they want to come around. It's the young ones because they haven't seen a boat. And if you look in the background there, you can see the, uh, the sea lions and the, the small seals, but it's just a, it's a free for all. So as we go north, at the very north of Cedros Island, there's another little village. And this is what we came to see or part of what we came to see because 
the only way to get to this village is how we're doing it by one of these ponga boats. So when you come in, the only way to come in is by boat. And as you can see, there's no protecting. So as we come in, the waves are tie, are slapping along the, the side of, of the waterway, but you have to time the waves to get your boat to come in. So we land, and this is what it looks like from the shore looking back. So you get an idea of what they have to what they have to deal with when it's bad weather. Uh, but this area up here, what I came to see, there was originally in the late 1800s a mining community up here. You're going to see in a few minutes where the Mexicans mined gold and copper. And uh, this area is mostly used for fishing now. There's no more mining, but you're going to see the gold and copper mines. So my interest here was. How do you power anything? Well, they got a big old diesel generator sitting there and uh, that makes electricity. So whenever they want electricity, they power this up and they have electricity. So there's the little community again, looking back at it as we are starting to hike up the hill. Uh, Jose, our guide, or the gentleman that showed us around the island, he's showing us of things you can eat. Well, here is a strawberry prickly bear and uh, he pulls it up and he peels it and it's the most delicious fruit <laughs> that I had ever had but it's a it's a prickly pear you'd look at it we'd look at it and go uh oh, you know wouldn't eat it but you know if you know how to eat it, it, it you can see why the Mexicans like it so as we're going I obviously I like cactuses but this is a plant you can see how green it is at the bottom because it's so hot in the summer and they get so little water, how over the hundreds of years this guy has survived uh, because he is able to trap a little bit of water in those limbs and that little bit of water sustains him enough to keep the bulb and to keep the lower part going. Again, another cactus blooming, but you really have to look at the cactus to see it blooming. So as we're heading, we're walking north, it's just a looking, America would be straight out where you look at that lighthouse way up at the top, 300 miles north of there is San Diego. So as we start to climb up, because the mines are higher up in the mountains, you start to see things change. All of a sudden you see cloud cover that is coming in. Well, clouds produce moisture. Moisture is what plants want. And so you, you start to see these just amazing plants that you go along. Uh, a cactus here that is just over the hundreds of years, of how, how they survive again is just barely, they just, eat, they find this little corner. And then you see a green tree and <laughs> same thing you go, how does a green tree survive in this environment? So the farther up we go, you start to see it getting cooler and we start to see telltales of the old copper mines and the gold mines because um, the top of this mountain is where the clouds more or less congregate and uh, it, it slowly leaches um, all of the copper and the minerals out of the out of the telltales and they're going down the hill. So we're now up at the top where the mine is and this was a well that they had built in the late 1800s early 1900s obviously to store water uh, but you can see Jose there he's soaking wet where we all were because the clouds had come in and the top of the mountain is now covered and this is why there's a few green things around. These are some of the things left over from the mine. And, uh, you know, the Mexicans typical just leave things that there's nothing has been changed. But this is all stuff left over from the early mining days. And it was just interesting. There was an old mine shaft. There was a couple of these and they've almost all closed in. So we're now coming back out and uh, we're heading back, back to the boat. And uh, we now are back at the boat and our friends, Victor and Carolina and their two boys, we told them as we were leaving the next day, they should come out. And so they took their boat and brought it around to our boat. And obviously they had never been aboard a sailboat before. So again, just an amazing family. They're two boys and anyway, great picture. 
So here, here I'm now leaving the next day. Jamie, my friend Jamie and Elaine ended up uh, going south from here. They went to Cabo San Lucas and uh, La Paz and Mazatlan and places beyond. But I got off and I flew back home. This is the Cedros International Airport, <laughs> which is a joke. <laughs> but, uh, so we have to wait for an airplane. Airplane comes in and to fly us flies back to Ensenada. And on our way back, we ended up flying over the harbor again. And this is a picture I took. You can see our boat or my uh, Jamie's boat sitting down there, the sailboat, what it actually looks like when we were there. Um, it's just, you know, nothing changes much there. So as we're flying north, these are what the island looks like from the air. Why, what you saw a few minutes ago along the coastline with all of the, the wildlife. And the northern part of the island where the clouds came in, this is the Pacific Ocean clouds coming in, getting hung up on the tops of Cedros. And this is where the water on the top of Cedros comes from. And that's it. That's good. Mm. Very good, Barney. Yeah, great, Barney. Yeah. A crater lake again, I see. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Very good. I enjoyed Taiwan, Barry. Thank you. Thank you. It really looked inviting. Well, if you if you have a vague interest in beaches, I mean, I, I've been on many beaches in different parts of the world, obviously not everywhere, but they're some of the most beautiful beaches. The water is so amazingly beautiful as you saw and and the country is is for an american brings his dollar over oh my god it's cheap we our son our son went to thailand with the college and he went up to chiang mai and what have you and we figured he was going to be with the college tour the whole time well he decided he needed to go surfing at down at phuket and he took one of those uh, buses that had chickens and whatever and, and went all the way down to Phuket, went surfing, and then came back. And it was only like a couple months before the tsunami came in there. And right. he hadn't told us 